Equitable education financing. Adequate funding and resource allocation is essential for inclusion and equity in education to ensure that the needs of different groups are met and they can access the same opportunities and learning outcomes. If we think back to our rights-based perspective from Module 2, we understand that governments must finance and allocate resources for education so that it is free and universal for all. According to the right to education, it is an obligation under international law for countries to mobilize and invest in maximum possible resources for education. At the global level, the implementation of SDG 4, as reflected in the Incheon Declaration, refers the budgeting and financing again and again in order to ensure inclusion and equity. First of all, it reinforces that countries should allocate 4 to 6 percent of the gross domestic product GDP or 15 to 20 percent of national spending to education. Secondly, it emphasizes how important it is for countries to revise budget and resource allocation to make sure that the target specific groups or areas of education that need more attention to ensure inclusion and equity as they implement each of the targets of SDG 4. For example, this includes targeted financing for groups such as migrants, ethnic and linguistic minorities, people from lower social economic backgrounds and children with disabilities as we have explored in other modules of this course. It also includes targeted financing for specific areas of education that will foster inclusion and equity such as early childhood education, skill development, education for global citizenship, or ensuring inclusion for curriculum development in teacher training and in school facilities. National education budgeting. So what are the different sources of funding and how is a budget actually allocated? We can start by taking an overview of different sources of financing. Financing can be either public or private, or it can be domestic or external. First, we have domestic funding, which includes national education budgets. According to GPE, the Global Partnership for Education, we can look at national budget allocation in the following steps. First, a national budget is formed by the Ministry of Finance with inputs from other ministries. Second, the budget goes through an approval process where admins are made if needed before it enacts into law. Third, the budget is implemented by each line ministry, including the Ministry of Education. Lastly, the budget is evaluated through an audit to ensure its effectiveness. How are these national budgets then allocated? This can vary by country. GPE provides an overview of different classification of spending. For example, a country might divide regular spending from development, investment, capital spending, or it might be allocated in terms of the following four classifications. First, administrative, such as a government department. Second, program, a specific program or activity. Third, economic, such as salaries or supplies. Fourth, functional, based on a specific objectives or goals. Under economical spending, for instance, we can imagine allocation of teachers, teaching assistants and counsellors in disadvantaged schools and areas. Under functional spending, we could imagine a possibility of a budget line that specifically serves equity and inclusion or a specific marginalised group external financing. We also have external sources of funding, meaning that they come from outside of the country. This includes international aid, which can help address the financing gap between national spending and those required to reach international targets. Most international aid comes as part of overseas development assistance from countries and is projected to average about 39 billion US dollars between 2015 and 2030. The Incheon Declaration recognized the main challenges that needed to be addressed, including the need to improve equity of external financing. This is especially relevant for us because it asks countries to focus on neglected subsectors 
low-income countries, vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, and conflict areas, to name but a few. We will come back to external financing as we look at specific examples later on in this module and first look at different funding mechanisms for equitable education at the national level. Equity-based formula for education. A key reference here is the equity formula, a formula that allows for the distribution and allocation of resources based on school needs. The Bowfield Foundation explained this as distribution system that recognizes the different needs and complexities of schools. This means that more funding can be allocated to schools that have more needs based on the social or economic complexity as opposed to simply being based on the number of students or the size of the school. Let's look at a more specific example of an equity formula used in New Zealand. As of January 2023, New Zealand is using equity funding. The way this works is using a school's equity index number known as EQI, which is a number ranging from 244 to 569, which is given based on the socio-economic factors that have an impact on students' learning achievement. Examples of those socio-economic factors that are considered here include first, parent socio-economic background, second, child socio-economic background such as poverty, abuse, neglect, third, national status or immigration background, fourth, transcends such as how often they move home. The number is then matched to estimated funding based on the equity funding rate on the funding curve. The EQI is then multiplied by the number of students on the school roll and equals to the total amount of funding that a school will receive for that year. Let's look at an example of this together. A school has an EQI of 489, which based on the equity funding rate works out at $538.48 New Zealand cents per student. This is then multiplied by 798, the number of students in the school. Given the results of $429,707.04 New Zealand cents of annual funding, this is a great example of how an equity formula can be created and adapted for different countries, provinces and local authorities depending on where funding is determined. Direct government financing. Direct government financing is an additional source of national financing beyond the education budget and can include financing such as conditional cash transfers, family subsidies, school grants and village funds, to name just a few, um, that are all directly funded by a country's government. According to the World Bank, transfers both cash and in-kind, such as school feeding, can be an effective strategy to bring children back to school who have dropped out, something that become a big concern as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Australia, which has been working towards improving equity has been dedicating government financing for equitable education through school grants that will enable cultural diversity and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. One of these initiatives is the Supporting Parent Engagement Grants program, where school grants focus on building up the school community and supporting parental engagement as positive factors for greater equity. The grants can be used to host community events, improve community meeting spaces, and connect vulnerable parents with carers to name just some examples. Another great example from Australia is the Future of Education Equity Fund, where direct government financing provides family subsidies which support parents from school expenses such as school uniforms, excursions, sport equipment, and music lessons. Payments are available to support students from preschool to upper secondary level and invite parents to apply who can prove their financial responsibility and low income status. In Brazil, the Balsa Family Program, PBF, 
helps families living in poverty and extreme poverty with conditions around education and health through direct cash transfers. Every month, families can access these benefits through a personal and non-transferable magnetic card based on conditions such as school enrollments, vaccinations, and prenatal care. Another way that governments finance equitable education is through small loans. The Thailand Village Fund is the second largest microcredit fund in the world, reaching 30% of households through local village funds committees. An assessment of the fund found that while it is highly altruistic as a model, the fact that the benefits and social are social rather than financial might mean that they take little risks to innovate. Socioeconomic factors in specific areas. This was especially the case between children that received additional support at home when learning online and those who didn't. Thanks to these funds, municipality can draw from the fund to target specific areas that are disadvantaged, for example, those with high unemployment or low educational levels to give them more support and opportunities. Overall, we now have a better understanding of what equitable financing actually is so that resources are targeted and distributed to support those that are most vulnerable so that they can have access to the same opportunities. The way that a government budget is distributed is so important to make that happen, whether it is in terms of a specific classification that targets a particular group or areas of education or through an equity formula that is adapted to the local context. Beyond the national education budget, other types of financing such as direct government financing or taxes and earmark funding offer alternatives to finance equitable education.